Welcome to part four of my video series, My Journey to Islam. If you haven't already done it, just hit the subscribe button so that you always get you know, up to date with all of my latest videos. Now, part four, My Journey to Islam. Really now I think we should be calling it My Journey Inside Islam because you know I'm already now a Muslim by this point and I have been for several years. In part three, I believe uh, we finished by me telling you that I got the job in Saudi Arabia, that I was living in Morocco and that I applied for the job as a conversation teacher in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So just to recap that bit, I was living in Morocco, I realized that I really would like to continue to live in the land of the Muslims, but it wasn't sustainable for me to stay in Morocco and go back and do taxi work in, in the UK and then come back and live. And I couldn't find a job in Morocco that would allow me to support my family properly. So I started to look for work outside of Morocco. And I went to an internet cafe in the beautiful city of Marrakesh. Of course, we didn't have internet in our houses at that stage. And um, uh, yeah, we went, I went to the internet cafe and I started applying for jobs. And all of the jobs were teaching English. They were high level university jobs, teaching English grammar. And it, I knew my, my English wasn't at that level until I saw an advert for a conversation teacher. It was just a dream come true. You mean I can go to Saudi Arabia, live in Saudi Arabia, get paid for just conversation, helping people to be able to speak English? Nothing could be easier. Perfect. I applied for the job. I mentioned in part three, so I won't go through it again. I didn't get the job at first. I mean, I waited and I waited and I waited. And after two months, alhamdulillah, I got the job. I was so excited. Just I didn't, you know, I, I was, how old was I? I guess I was about 20, I think I was about 25 years old. I was 25 years old. I already had uh, Abdullah, my other son, Abdurrahman, and my daughter, Aisha. So they were all born. And I, so I had three children at that point. I was so excited. I went over to the UK. I got the visa and I landed in the city of Jeddah. Oh, what a feeling. I'd come from this little, little town of Marrakesh, beautiful Marrakesh, and now I was in this huge city of Jeddah. It was huge for me compared to Marrakesh and compared to London, my city. The roads were like American roads. They were wide and big and there were skyscrapers and everything was in Arabic. And at that time, not many people spoke English here in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Alhamdulillah, today, so many people, but not, not back then. Anyway. I landed, they picked me up, they put me in a hotel for the night, the company, and then I went to work the next day. And I always remember it was a company called Direct English, which is an English language center. I visited them. This is, the story I'm telling you is 20 years ago. I visited the same location uh, a couple of months ago when I was in Jeddah, amazing. Anyway, I arrived, so excited. There was a guy there uh, in charge of logistics and reception, and his name was Hossam. I think he was Lebanese. Anyway, uh, Hussam welcomed me and I said, Hi, I'm Abdurrahman. Salaamu Alaikum, I'm Abdurrahman. I'm the new conversation teacher. And he said, Welcome, Abdurrahman. I said, Thank you so much. And he said, Actually, though, we've got all the conversation teachers we need. So we're going to put you in the grammar class. My heart started beating. Grammar. I don't know grammar. I don't know the difference between a verb and a violin. I mean, look, I, I, I understood it, but I couldn't, you know, I wasn't qualified at that point in how to really teach it. And um, I thought to myself, this is a nightmare. This is not going to work. So obviously I told him, no problem, looking forward to it. And I went and I had my first class. They gave me training the first day. I went into my first class and I realized at that point that I knew nothing. Nothing. I couldn't explain anything and I felt like an idiot. I got back to the hotel. <laughs> In fact, that was the first night I got back to my hotel and I always remember it. I called my wife and I said to my wife, babe, this is not going to end well. And I believed, Allahi, I believed that before one month had finished, I'd be back in Marrakesh with them because I didn't know what I was doing. I was terrible. Terrible. Anyway, the first week, I got through the first week and it was bad. I got through the second week. It wasn't much better. Then they realized this guy doesn't know anything. And I told them, I know I don't know anything. I thought I was teaching conversation. 
So then they gave me teacher training. They started to put me on courses. They started to develop me. And I started to learn and then after that become qualified in teaching English. But it took time. After about four or five months, I was actually quite good at it and I enjoyed it. And I always remember, I always remember, I had one student, his, this student, his father owns an amazing restaurant called Al Baik. I wish I could find this student again. If anyone knows him, I think his father was called Abu Ghazala or something. If anyone knows his son, who I used to teach in Jeddah 20 years ago, put me in touch with him. I'd love to see him now. I remember it was when I was teaching him that I realized I'm pretty good at this and I enjoy it. And I felt happy because I was helping people. And when I finished work, I used to feel a real sense of happiness, not only because I was helping people, because I was living in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I was so safe. I was enjoying my life, safety, security. In Jeddah, we'd go sometimes, we could, we'd wake up for breakfast, um, wake up in the morning, and I'd say to my youngest son, Abdullah, I'd say, why don't we just go and make Umrah before work? Work starts at nine o'clock. We'd wake up at about maybe five o'clock, 4.30, five o'clock, shoot straight down to Mecca. It took us about 45 minutes by car, make Umrah, get back to, get back to Jeddah get changed, alhamdulillah, go to work. These things, you can't quantify them. I spent my whole life as a young Muslim wishing one day I could see the Kaaba, wish, wishing one day I could see Mecca. And here I was, 45 minute drive between the two of us. I could probably do it in, the, in even less than that. But the fact is, what a life. I, I couldn't believe how blessed I felt. And everything was going well. I was enjoying my teaching. And then one day I came into work and Abdus Salam, uh, an amazing brother uh, from Eritrea, Abdus Salam, he was standing at reception and I walked in to go to my class, salam alaikum. And he said, no, no, not today. Not today. You have to go into the manager's office. What? He said they fired the previous manager. I won't say his name. They fired him last night. And Dr. Hatim said, you have to be in his place for now. I said, yeah, okay, Abdul Salam. I'm going to go to class, yeah? He said, no, really, Abdul Rahman, really. I said, Abdul Salam, what am I going to do? I'm a teacher. And I said it proudly now because I was happy. I felt, you know, I'd found what I was good at. And you're telling me, don't teach my students. I can see my students like, oh, no, don't go and teach them. Go and sit in that office. What do I know about management? Anyway, he said, no, Dr. Hatton said it. I'm still in touch with Dr. Hatton. You know, if you're watching this, Dr. Hatton, may Allah bless you. I learned a lot from you. I learned a lot. Anyway. I went and sat in the manager's uh, office. I sat in his chair and can you imagine how uncomfortable I felt? It was a huge office, big office with a big glass window. And I could see all of my colleagues, all of my friends that before I was teaching with, all of them were walking past saying to me, what's going on? And I, all I could do is say to them, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. So anyway, I sat there and I felt so embarrassed. Why? Because everybody was just walking past. Customers were walking past, parents walking past of some of the students. I didn't know what I was doing. And the time just was going so slowly. I hated it. All I knew is this is not for me. Anyway, second day I came in. Absalom said, same thing. Third day, same thing. So, oh, this is getting crazy now. Like I'm not even doing it. I'm getting paid. I'm not even doing anything. So I remember at that point, I had a talk with Dr. Hatton. I said, Dr. Hatton, what do you want from me? He's the CEO. I said, what do you want from me? He said, we want you to do your best, give it your best shot. We are looking for another manager, but you never know. If you can prove yourself, maybe it'll be you. I thought, maybe it can be me. My father's a businessman. My father's always been a great leader. You know, I've seen, I know what leadership's about. I've seen so many movies, television. I, I know what you have to do. I said to Dr. Hatton, Dr. Hatton, I'm gonna give it my best shot. And I worked blood, sweat, and tears for three months. I worked so hard to be the best manager that I could be. And after three months, everybody hated me. Nobody would listen to me. Nobody would do anything I asked them to do. And everybody wanted me out of the organization. I was a disaster because I was telling people, do this, I need you to do that. I want you to do this, I want you to. I was thinking this is management, this is leadership. No. This is, this is a terrible example of management and leadership, telling people what to do. You have to be able to influence people, but I didn't understand leadership back then. Anyway, after about three months, this most amazing individual called Khalil Campbell. Khalil, if you're watching this, I've mentioned you in many videos because you were my first true mentor. If it wasn't for you, I would never have been inspired to become the leader that I've become and the coach that I am today. 
So Khalil contacted me and Khalil said, we need to have a talk. And I thought at that point, this is it. This is what I've been waiting for. This is when I was telling my... Tell, <laughs> and Khalil contacted me and Khalil said, Abdurrahman, we need to have a talk. And I thought to myself, all right, I get it. This is what I was telling my wife when I first arrived. Babe, this isn't going to end well. It's happening now. You know, just as I got my groove as a teacher, now I've gone and screwed it up trying to be a manager. I'll just pack my things and leave. And he explained to me, no, no, we don't need to leave, but I'm going to help you. I'm going to help and develop you. And he took me under his wing and he provided me with training from himself and training videos from other people. And I started at that point to understand what it meant to be a manager and more importantly, what it meant to be a leader. And I spent four amazing years in that organization. Now this video series started being called My Journey to Islam. So I think now what I'm doing is I'm really talking about my life living in Saudi Arabia. So maybe I'm gonna start a new series about life in Saudi Arabia. But I will share one amazing thing that happened to me with you. After four years of working for Al Khalij company, and it was an amazing company, I wanted then to move on to something different. I let them know I needed to leave and I asked them to transfer my sponsorship. Their company policy was, we don't transfer your sponsorship. If we bring you into the country, because that work permit, we paid for it and we need to be able to use it for somebody else if you're leaving, our policy is we don't allow transfers, but you're welcome to leave and come back in. I really wanted a transfer. I tried everything I could to convince them to give me the transfer. But ultimately, they had a policy. And I couldn't, you know, I should have just respected that policy. But anyway, I was, in, I was young and I was impatient and I was pushing them, please give me a transfer. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go to a competitor. I got this organization, that organization. And I had so many offers of places that I could start working, but I couldn't start working unless they transferred my sponsorship. And they refused. And this battle, you could call it, went on for almost a year. Now, in that year, things got quite tough for me because I wasn't working anymore for the company. I was in limbo. I was doing a bit of work here and a bit of work there. One of the places I went to work was a language center, MITM. Anyway, it was a language center and I was doing some part-time work there in the evening. When I used to teach there, I can tell you now, this is how many years ago? Tw uh, 16 years ago, so I'm not showing off. I know I did a good job. I put everything into it, even though life was tough for me. It was really difficult, you know, very, very difficult. My wife was pregnant at that point with our... Um, yeah, would that have been my fifth child at that time? So things were really tough, okay? Things were not easy at all. I put my heart and soul into every lesson that I taught. This was not a big language school. I wasn't getting paid a lot of money, but I loved what I did. And the reason I'm telling you that is look what came from it. I was looking around at that time for a job, any job that I could find. I didn't know, but the person who owned that language center, one of the partners was somebody very high up in King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah. He was hearing from uh, uh, students in the language center in the evenings, he was hearing, everyone was talking about this guy, Abdurrahman, oh, teacher Abdurrahman, he's good. Oh, you, people were requesting me, they were telling other classes, we don't want that teacher, we want teacher Abdurrahman. He started saying, who's this guy Abdurrahman that I'm hearing so many good things about? So he asked to meet me. I met him, we had a nice talk. He said, look, why don't you come and work at King Abdulaziz University? Now, by that time, I had what I needed in terms of experience, qualifications, but I, I thought that, you know, maybe a, I needed a lot more experience. I don't know. I wasn't even looking at universities. When I was looking for work, it was language centers, really. Um, I was looking for management work, um, but also I was open to being a teacher or a coordinator. Anyway, he said to me, why don't you come and work at King Abdulaziz University? We'll give you a family package we'll, that's free medical, free tickets every year to the UK. See, my previous package, by the way, with Al Khalij was single status, meaning I had to pay for the tickets for myself, medical insurance at that time for myself. Um, this was an amazing opportunity, an amazing, amazing uh, opportunity. I said, SubhanAllah, look at this. If what I wanted Al Khalij to do and let me transfer all those months ago, because this was after about 10 or 11 months of arguing or trying to get them to, to give me a transfer. If they'd given me what I wanted, I'd never be working in that language center and I'd never have met this guy, 
And the doctor would never have said to me, who's this guy, Abdul Rahman? And we would then never have sat down and he would never have said to me, why don't you come and work at King Abdul Aziz University? They gave me the package. I couldn't believe it. I mean, when I can think about it now, it wasn't amazing. But for me and my family, it was a dream come true. I said, that's amazing. Look at the mercy of Allah. God's the best of planners. If sometimes you want something, right? But it's not good for you. Sometimes you hate something, but it's good for you. I hated the fact that Al Khalij wouldn't transfer my sponsorship, but I love them, alhamdulillah, for not transferring my sponsorship because that was part of Allah's plan, Allah's qadr, the divine decree for me to meet this individual and to get given the opportunity to go and work at King Abdul Aziz University. Let me tell you something that's even more amazing that emphasizes and compounds this point. And there's a reason that I'm sharing this personal story with you. We accepted the offer from King Abdulaziz University. It did mean that we had to leave the country and come back in. We did that. It wasn't easy, but we did it because the opportunity was so great. When we came back in, I was teaching at King Abdulaziz University for about three or four months. And my wife had taken my youngest daughter to the hospital for a checkup. She, I think she, she was a bit sick. Later that day, my wife called me and I'll never forget her words. She said, I'm here with the doctor. He says, there's a problem with Asma's heart. There's a problem with her heart. Unless, some, unless you've been in that position where somebody's given you a call and told you that there's a problem with your child's heart, I don't know if you'll never be able to understand what it's like. But I can remember where I was standing, what I was wearing. I can remember who was in the room. I can remember everything about that day, that moment. We investigated it at King Abdulaziz University Hospital. They did investigations. They found that she had a problem with her heart. They did further investigations. They found that she had a congenital uh, abnormality, that she was born with a very rare condition called trisomy 9P. It's a very rare genetic condition. My daughter Asma then for the years and years and years, from that moment when I heard about the whole, or the, it wasn't a whole, I'm sorry, about the defect, or the, not defect, the problem with her heart. From that time until seven years later, she needed brain surgery, lung surgery, heart surgery. She had open heart surgery when she was one and a half years old, which is almost unheard of. Uh, she had um, uh, uh, kidney failure, liver failure, heart failure, like every single thing you could think of, she had. The cost of all of her medical treatment was covered by King Abdulaziz University Medical Insurance. Any other, of, any other of the offers that I had had in the 12 months before that time that I was pushing them, please let me transfer, I want to go to this company, I want to go to that company. If we had gone to any of those companies, none of them, with their medical insurance, none of them would have covered what care she needed. None of them. Because it doesn't cover congenital uh, defects. It doesn't cover uh, congenital abnormalities. It would never have paid for her open heart surgery. It wouldn't have covered any of those things. They would have simply said to me, sorry, go back to the, go back to the UK, go back to England. We can't keep it. There's no way. You can't. We, ca we would have been finished. I said, subhanAllah, look at that divine, divine, subhanAllah, look at that. Not only did we, alhamdulillah, you know, get that opportunity to work in King Abdul Aziz University, and from that we learned to be patient with what comes to us. Be patient. You want something, oh, give me the transfer, oh, no, we're not going to give it to you. You're going to keep fighting, or you're just going to put your hands up and pray and say, oh, Allah, make it easy for me, and be, just accept. Be patient. Not only did Allah will for us to get that job, but it was the one job that covered all of her medical bills, which came to over a million rials. The open heart surgery by itself came to over 450,000 rials. She got the most amazing care until the time that she passed away. Allah yarhamha asma. The reason I'm sharing that story, I've got many stories, but I don't share them all. The reason I'm sharing that story is to teach people the importance or the awareness that as human beings, we can't see around corners. We can't. We're not a drone. We can see here. But we have to be patient in believing that around that corner 
is something that's been decreed for us. We just have to keep moving in life and go around that corner. But if we fight it and fight it and fight it, we're only gonna hurt ourselves. And sometimes you might love something and it's bad for you. I wanted, I loved that I had been transferred to another company after leaving Al Khalij. I would have loved that, but it would have been bad for me. And sometimes you hate something, but it's good for you. I hated the fact that they wouldn't transfer me. I hated the fact that I was having to work you know, 16 hours a day teaching here and teaching there. I hated it, but it was good for me because I met that individual who offered me the opportunity at King Abdulaziz University. And then not knowing once we came back into the country three months later, I get the phone call to tell me there was a problem with my uh, daughter's heart and what that would then spiral into seven years of hospital admission. So this is a lesson, right? This is a lesson. We never know what's around corners. Be patient with what comes to us, you know? Maybe you hate something, but it's good for you. Anyhow, wrapping up this little segment, alhamdulillah, I stayed four years in King Abdulaziz University working as a, initially as a teacher, a coordinator, and then I got an opportunity to work in King Saud University in Riyadh. And that's when we moved to the amazing city of Riyadh. So after eight years in the beautiful city of Jeddah, we then moved to the beautiful city of Riyadh. I spent four years working in King, uh, King Saud University. And after that, I spent time working another four years in Saudi Electronic University here in Riyadh. And I spent another four years, in uh, almost four years in the amazing Dar al-Uloom University. But I was doing something that I wasn't passionate about. You see, I had created by Allah's permission, by God's permission, a really successful career. I had, you know, uh, I have until now a very strong reputation for going into university or academic, academic institutes, especially ones that are struggling and turning around underperforming departments and teams. That's what I'm great at. It's what I, for a long time, is what I loved doing. But what I really loved doing was coaching people. What I really loved doing was teaching people how to be effective leaders. That's what I love. That's what gets me excited, as you can see. The problem is, what I was known for in my day job was the academic side of things. So I decided, I decided to change that. I decided to make my side hustle my main hustle. That's definitely for another video. For now though, this is the conclusion, I think, to the four part series, we can call it now, my journey to Islam, because anything that I talk about now is gonna be my journey <laughs> after Islam. I think what I'll probably start doing, by the way, I'm probably gonna start doing some weekly vlogs so you can follow what I'm doing and what I'm up to during the week. You can see my life in Saudi Arabia. You can see what I do, my work, my coaching. And uh, I hope you'll be following me along. If you enjoyed this, like it, share it with other people, spread the positivity. For now, until the next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace.